Donatello's Gata Milana, considered to be one of his most famous and well-recognized works, a gem of early 15th century Renaissance, Italian Renaissance. What exactly is it? Who is this man, Gata Milana? Why does he stand there? Why is the statue even significant? Is it just, what's it made of? Or like, why is it sitting there? And what makes this itself a masterpiece of one of 10 years worth of commissions of Donatello's other work? Well, let's find out today. Erasmo the Ninety, the actual name of the man sitting up there in the statue of himself. His nickname, Gata Milana, meaning honey speckled cat, is speculated to be a reference to his mother, Milani Gatelli. But exactly who was this man? Well, in the time of the early 1400s, as in early 15th century and period of early Italian Renaissance, Italy itself was divided into many republics and city states, the republics of Florence and Venice and many others all vying for power. So what could you do if you didn't have the exact army and mass to take over the other countries? You hire a mass and take over the other republics. Mr. Erasmo the Narni, a condottiere at the time, which means a um, mercenary general, was a very, very well-respected mercenary, of course. He served under several generals and the Republic of Florence before finally finding himself in the service of the Republic of Venice. From there, they wanted to expand their actual territory to the city of Padua. God Milata himself was able to conquer a lot further. And this is exactly why he is commemorated here. He was such a very well respected general. We could go on and on in detail as to the way he won, he won his battles, as to the amount of battles he won, but of the dozens and dozens of victories and, vi and cities that he managed to conquer for the Republic of Venice in general, his family felt he deserved a statue after he passed in 1443. But what really makes this uh, statue significant? Um, well, a couple of things come to mind readily. Um, first of all, it's an equestrian statue, as in Gautamalata himself is riding a very noble looking horse right there, which seen from several angles can be like almost intimidating in a way. Um, this is the first equestrian statue not depicting a famous ruler at the time, since the Romans were primarily known for making large bronze statues. Donatello's um, masterpiece of this was a little controversial at the time. The city of Padua actually wasn't exactly certain if they should let Donatello actually put this statue up. But hey, they did, and now it's still there. It's, um, and uh, again, since the Roman, um, such a feat had not been attempted, and even, like, has succeeded in quite a while, you can see the entire 12 feet of bronze being held up there by three sturdy horse legs and one barely touching horse, like, on top of an oar right there. Alright, alright, but what makes this exactly a masterpiece? Donatello himself wanted to actually preserve not only Gautamalata with this, but, um, his, his health, his, like, his set of skills, as made evident go into his level of detail here you can see he captures very very distinctly the confidence the height of the career that was Gautamalata's conquests for the Republic of Venice his very very confident like you can see just a rest self-assured face captured very beautifully um the horse himself the detail like there um down to the veins of the front of his head and little indentation this is we're talking 12 feet high of bronze, as in like he sat there over 10 years time with the amount of commissions that he did. He sat there and had to sculpt out every little crevice and all the parts of the skin here and every little eye detail on both of their faces, not to mention the entire armor of Gautamalata himself, all down, down so very expertly. The expressions are lifelike and confident. Like, I actually, I, I wasn't aware of myself. The cherubs sitting at the belt of Gautamalata, almost like him being blessed, or since like since they were like small angels, heavenly children, him being blessed by God himself, and like rising and going forth, as in like a very intelligent, very powerful man. Another thing that strikes me is um, the humanist perspective of this sort of thing, like just to remark again that um, Gautamalata himself was not exactly a, a conqueror for himself or for a republic that he led. He was a civic servant sort of thing under the Republic of Venice that was trying to immortalize him in the statue. But it's like taking more of a commonplace man, not like a like, not like an emperor from Rome or like further down the line like um an emperor like Napoleon because he comes out riding a horse in some equestrian art. It's not taking this powerful iconic figure. It's taking this ordinary man who was hired and rose and proved himself 
and immortalizing him like that, which is also like a very cool non his part. There's also the matter of the cannonball sitting right there that um, the horse is currently placing its hoof upon. It's speculated as to whether or not that is actually a cannonball or um, earth itself in some interpretations of the statue, as in like, out of a lot of could have gone forth and conquered a lot more, or here he is in near his grave, um, at the height of his career depicted conquering even as he's passed on into a heavenly realm, also reference to the chair of Black Square. So, in conclusion, Donatello's got him a lot of a 12 foot high bronze statue depicting Nevasmo the Ninety, the mercenary general who served Venice, the Republic of Venice at the time, in their territorial expansion, is immortalized here in such beautiful, beautiful detail even down to the expressions and the directions that they're looking to the details such as the cherub and all the chinks in the armor and stuff that's exactly how he would have wanted to be remembered that's exactly how his family would have wanted to be remembered and in my opinion of the many many paintings and statues done by Donatello himself including the statues of David and Magdalene this is by far one of his best works like a classic masterpiece of the early Italian Renaissance if not one of the best works of the early renaissance itself. But that's all I've got him a lot to say about that. Join us next week as we discuss the Sistine Chapel and how long it took for Michelangelo to paint all that.